Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be investigating axial forces. We'll be looking at the type of axial forces that can be applied to the uh, members or elements in a frame. We will be considering both tension force and compression force, and investigating some of the unique aspects of both of them, and also discussing uh, stability in column design, uh, Euler column buckling, global flexural buckling, and assorted uh, assorted interesting uh, axial force uh, aspects. So the topic for today is axial forces. So let's say we have an element and some sort of element, it could be at any angle. And if we are loading this axially, now you couldn't tell by my crappy diagram, um, but this would actually be a uh, we're going to consider prismatic members today, which means they have a, a constant uh, area and shape along their cross-section, or a constant cross-section along their length. So let's say we have a force here. And it, an axial force, of course, can go, uh, you can have tension or compression. And we will have, if it is, uh, if it is a, a tensile force, we will refer to that as a positive axial force. So positive tension and negative compression. All right, and uh, these forces, uh, axial forces, they can be either varying or constant along a member. And we will be uh, investigating those as we go along today. So you've seen statics, uh, you've seen mechanics, so you know what uh, we, you know what tension and compression are. Although I did, I did want to just today uh, go maybe do a little bit uh, deeper uh, discussion to get into the nature of what tension and compression are. Okay, so let's first look at tension. Tension. Well, what is tension? Of course, with tension, we are trying to pull molecules apart. Um, tensile forces will try to pull molecules apart. That makes sense. So if I have a string of atoms in, say, a fiber, very small fiber, they're going to have chemical bonds between them. And when I apply a tensile force, each and every uh, bond between the atoms or molecules is going to be stretched. And, you ha and through this electromagnetic attraction, uh, you have the ability to generate tensile resistance. That's simple enough, I think. Um, and then this is, of course, looking at the molecular view. So, um, And then that does uh, scale up to the bulk material view. All right, um, now something happens, of course, when we do pull on an element. Um, when you pull on something, of course, when you pull on a member, uh, a rod, a rope, whatever it might be, uh, this is still made of a solid. Uh, you know, you, even when you're applying tensile force, this element is still made of solid matter, even if you're putting a very large force upon it. And so something, uh, so let's think about two basic elementary, you know, science, like let's think seventh grade science. Um, think about the definition of what a solid, liquid, and a gas are. A gas has neither constant volume nor constant shape. A liquid has constant shape, or sorry, a constant volume, but non-constant shape. And a uh, solid has both uh, constant volume and constant shape. That's the basic seventh grade definition of a solid. Now, when you apply a tensile force, you do warp the shape a bit, but interestingly enough, the volume doesn't change. As such, when you pull on an element, the volume is going to remain constant. And thus, if, you're, if you want to pull on an element and make it longer, the only way volume can be held constant is if the diameter or, sh or uh, cross-sectional area decreases. And this makes intuitive sense when you pull when you pull on something it will tend to get thinner. That's all uh, basic mechanics that and also that matches with our intuitive sense. 
Uh, so when doing tension design, especially when you get into things like steel and concrete, um, tension is probably an easier thing to design for than compression in some respects. At least once you actually have a grip on whatever you're uh, pulling. Once you actually have a grip on whatever you're pulling, uh, tensile uh, forces, your tensile stress is simply going to be, oh, your uh, force divided by area, and it's not too bad. Now, often what you do have to consider in design classes, for example, you do have to put a lot of effort into designing the connections. That is always the case, because for something like steel, if you have a bolted connection and you're pulling on an element, you can get all sorts of failures, like you can get tear out failures, where the bolts simply just tear out of the section, or an entire net section fracture where a, a chunk of material is pulled out. But uh, tension, as long as, so with tension, when you're pulling on something, um, you can often get failures at the ends when you're trying to pull it apart and it ends up just tearing away from the, from whatever bolts or welds you're uh, holding this together with. But uh, if you manage to get a good grip on it, tension is a relatively under, uh, understandable uh, bulk phenomenon. Okay, so that's tension. But what about compression? We're going to spend more time talking about compression today because in some ways it's a bit more interesting. Or at least it's a, um, a bit more complex. And when I say tension is simpler, what I mean is that the tensile capacity of, an, of a member is not really a function of its length. Um, if I make something longer, if I, if I have a rope that's 10 feet long or a rope that's 20 feet long with the same cross-sectional area, ignoring things like self-weight, the tensile capacity of a rope or a cable is pretty much the same regardless of how long it is. But that's not the case with, col with uh, compression uh, forces and compression stresses, and we're going to look at that uh, today. Okay. So let's next consider compression. Now, on the bulk level, it's relatively understandable, or relatively simple, I should say. That's not something you want to hear for your, from your professor. It's relatively understandable. So let's say you have a column or a compression element, and you apply a, a negative axial force or a compression, a compression force. Now, uh, based on the same uh, consideration of, cons of maintain maintenance or conservation of volume, when you compress this, it's going to want to expand outward bulge outward a bit to preserve uh, area, to preserve total volume. Again, if the length is going to decrease, we would want, uh, in order to preserve volume, the diameter is going to have to swell a bit. Also, uh, you may have heard, uh, uh, I'm sure you may remember from uh, mechanics, uh, Poisson's ratio. Which, of course, is the ratio of axial uh, strain to radial strain. In other words, some material materials, uh, in terms of if I apply a certain strain in the axial direction, there is going to, again, there's going to be a outward radial strain as well. And the ratio between those two strains is Poisson's ratio, and that is a material property. Okay, so that's fine, but that's all well and good. And uh, I guess compression is a little bit easier uh, than tension. The fact that it's not as difficult to get a hold of a compression element. If you can just, you can simply just apply two pressure, you know, two plates or something on the ends of an uh, on the ends of a column. You know, if you if you're testing like a concrete cylinder or something, it's not hard to get a grip on that when testing it. Like if you have a concrete cylinder and you want to measure its F prime C value, its uh, compressive stress value, all you have to do is just put it in a compression cylinder and load it up, 
And the, of course, there's a certain uh, testing protocol you need to use, but getting a grip, getting a hold of the element is not as critical as, or is not as difficult as it is with a tension element. With tension, it's going to want to slip out with compression. Um, it, at least getting a grip on it isn't too bad, but in turn for it, be, for the connections maybe being a little bit easier in some ways, uh, compression adds its, uh, its own unique challenges, which we'll look at. And to really understand this, I need to zoom in and look at the atomic level, the atomic or molecular level. See, there is a debate, a theoretical debate, uh, a long-standing, very old debate, um, where some have argued before that the compression strength of all materials, the true compression strength of all materials, is zero. Strange. How could the compression strength of materials be zero? I mean, I have, uh, for example, a water bottle here. I mean, I can see very clearly that if I try to compress this, I'm not going to be able to do that. If I try to crush this, I'm not going to be able to do that with my bare hands. So how could anyone think that compression strength of doesn't actually exist in materials? How, isn't that just madness? How could that be? But yeah, some have, some have actually argued before and uh, it, they can make very, you can actually make a very good argument that true compression strength doesn't actually exist. And to understand why, we need to zoom in to the molecular or the atomic level. So if you zoom in, consider that, that chain of molecules or atoms we saw before um, in our, when we discussed tension. So let's say you have a string of atoms or molecules and they're joined together by atomic bonds or molecular bonds, uh, covalent, ionic, whatever is holding them together. Now, think about, so when I try to pull this, when I try to pull this in tension, uh, the, all of the bonds will engage and it can simply hold itself together in tension. But what happens if I try to compress this? What happens if I apply an inward force uh, to a chain of atoms? Well, if I just have a single chain of atoms, what's going to happen? I mean, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. This thing's just going to bow outward. And much worse than that, it's probably not even going to do that. It's probably going to do something. It's probably actually going to just bend something like this, uh, you know, a really wacky shape like that, depending how long it is, depending on how many atoms there are. A, uh, a chain of atoms is basically just a rope, you know, and, and, from, and uh, any experience, our everyday experience will tell us that you can't push a rope. I mean, this, this cloth here is not so different than a rope. It's just a very, I guess, thin and wide rope, if you want to think of it that way but it behaves exactly the same. I mean, I can put a tensile load on this cloth or I, can, I, could, I guess I could roll it up into a kind of rope-like shape like so, and I can pull on it and that, that uh, shape will be, that, uh, this object will be capable of resisting a decent amount of tensile force, at least in, on human scales, but its compressive capacity is basically zero. It cannot hold any substantial compressive force, stress, etc. It's, and again, this is, uh, this is pretty obvious. It's, uh, it is compatible with our everyday experience and knowledge that you can't push a rope. So, hmm. so if I apply a, if again, if I have a chain of, L, of molecules and I apply a compressive force, it's just going to buckle, bend, or twist out of the way. So, huh. And this is strange if you think about it because with, Tensile stresses, with tensile forces and tensile stresses, you can very clearly see how the, it's very easy to see how the, uh, the strength at the, at the atomic and molecular level simply scales up to the bulk material level. If I have a whole bunch of, you can just model a, uh, you know, for example, you can just model a bulk material as a long series, just a huge bundle of uh, various uh, molecules, each with their own bonds along their chains, and then you can model it as just, you can model pulling on the bulk object as simply pulling on a whole bunch of these chains. But think about that for compression. If a, a, a single chain of molecules has effectively zero compression, um, 
has effectively zero compression strength. How the heck do I get compressive strength at all on bulk objects? Um, I mean, if this is just, if I have a huge number of these chains, how does that help? I mean, this is a case of something almost literally being greater than the sum of its parts. If you have a whole, if you have uh, one series of atomic, uh, of atoms and molecules joined together in a chain, if I try to compress that, it will have effectively zero strength. But somehow, almost magically, if I have a whole bunch of them, millions of these chains joined together, if I try to compress a bulk object, suddenly I seem to generate compressive strength out of almost nowhere. Where does that strength come from? Well, let's think about that for a moment. So this is sort of the paradox of compressive strength. Uh, when you zoom in at the, again, when you zoom in at the molecular level, tension makes a lot of sense. You can um, pull on a chain of molecules and then you can simply, and that will be capable of resisting a large amount of force. But, uh, and then, and to conceptualize a bulk object, you can simply scale that up. But a chain of molecules will have effectively zero compressive strength. So where does the bulk strength of uh, materials in compression actually arise from? And you probably already know the answer, or you may already know the answer, but and uh, but we'll take a look here. So let's now consider a uh, a long series, not just a long, not just a single chain, but a collection of chains joined together or uh, placed next to one another. So I have a long series of these chains, like so. And I'm going to apply. I'm going to apply compressive forces to all of them. So imagine a long, again, imagine a long series of uh, atomic or molecular chains. And I am definitely approximating, I'm modeling these as having all of their uh, grain direction, all of their bond direction uh, aligned perfectly. That's, of course, not how things actually work, but I am just uh, discussing this in very general terms. Now, again, so imagine I have a long a series, or I have a series of these atomic chains, and to each of them, I'm going to apply compressive force. So, Yes, they can demonstrate that they can, of course, still just buckle and bend like before as I apply compressive load. However, um, there are still, uh, but there is now, because we have so many of these, because we have uh, not, not a single isolated chain, but multiple chains next to each other, we have to consider more than just the uh, atomic or molecular bonds that are along the axis of the member. Now we also have to think about interbonds bond, in the other direction, parallel bonds. And when you do this, something changes. So now if I try to compress this, now if you have a huge number of these, they can't all bow out in the same direction. So what's going to tend to happen is that some of them are going to want to bend and one are, are going to want to uh, some of these are going to want to uh, buckle and deform in one direction, like some of them will want to go like this, some of them will want to go like this, etc. They can't all buckle in a coordinated manner perfectly in the same direction, um, unless we start getting to, to much larger global behavior. But so they can't, uh, so they're going to, so, and again, their volume still will need to be conserved. So this is going to need to buckle outward. And However, if it wants to buckle, if, if we want to get this kind of wavy buckling type behavior um, at the molecular level, what's going to have to happen, though, is that these chains are going to have to become separated from another, from one another. However, we now have to consider 
the atomic bonds or molecular bonds that are between the chains. And if I want to cause these, if I wanted to cause, if I have two chains, two of these atomic chains, and I want to cause one to buckle this way or, and one to bend that way, if I want to do that, I'm going to have to sever these bonds. And severing bonds is ultimately what, what requires force. That's ultimately requires force and energy uh, to actually perform or if I want to deform those bonds, uh, et cetera. And think about this. As I'm applying this load between, again, these would be uh, a line of atomic bonds. As I'm trying to make these things bend outward, um, if I'm trying to make these things buckle as I'm applying compressive stress like this, uh, the bonds themselves are going to go into tension. The bonds between adjacent strains are going into tension. So I basically get tension perpendicular to my compressive load. So when I apply a compressive force to a bulk material, when I zoom in at the atomic level, what I can see is that what's actually, ha so again, if I have a single chain, that chain will simply buckle and deform with virtually no resistance. But when I have a bulk material, suddenly if I want to cause the actual uh, individual atomic chains to uh, buckle outward, I need to start severing and deforming perpendicular bonds. And suddenly that is, and so now my compressive force in this direction is generating tensile forces perpendicular to that. And as we saw in the tensile section, when we were discussing briefly tensile forces, uh, tensile stress between atoms and molecules absolutely does exist. I can pull on a chain of molecules just fine, and that will have the capability of generating resistive force. So ultimately, so this ultimately is where the idea uh, and the debate of whether compressive uh, force or compressive capacity actually exists arises from. This is ultimately where that uh, that debate comes from. And again, this kind of reveals the uh, the intimate connection between compressive and tensile force. Uh, the compressive strength or stress of an object is intimately tied uh, tied to its tensile properties. And again, the reason for this is because axial compression is because axial compression produces uh, radial tension. And this in turn introduces the entire area of stability. section and member stability, which we're going to look at next. OK, so questions so far. OK, so uh, I need to define stability. Which is probably something most of my students are lacking after one of my lectures. Please, not another terribly drawn diagram. Please, not more, not one more. I can't take it. So what do I mean? What do I mean by stability? Now, um, we could define stability a number of ways. But stability is actually its own, basically, sub-discipline within structural engineering or structural analysis. And stability, uh, perhaps we could define it as uh, the field that considers uh, 
a practice of investigating or considering Uh, considering, um, let's see, the ability of shapes, and by this I mean cross-sectional shapes or materials, uh, to resist buckling uh, while under Well, under axial load. What do I mean by now? So we've uh, we've used the term buckling a few times, but uh, let's actually define it. And first, we're going to talk about uh, Euler column buckling or global buckling. So let's first consider Euler column buckling or global buckling. So in, and I uh, specifically, if you want to be technical, Euler column buckling is actually uh, elastic flexural buckling. Or Euler buckling. And let's say you have a column and we apply an axial load. Now, if we apply an axial load, um, for uh, very short columns, buckling is not going to be a major concern. Uh, you're going to be able to carry the uh, axial force up to the yield stress or the crushing stress if you're dealing with concrete. But for long slender columns or skinny columns, what tends to happen is that they they bow outwards like this uh, here, or if you or let's see maybe I can draw another one here. They can also do if it's braced, for example, in the middle. You can get something like this here, double curvature bending, or you could even get something um, if you have, you know, multiple brace points. You can get buckling. Like here. all depending on the type of restraints you have, etc. So that's fine. Um, let's go and define the equation for Euler column buckling. And critical buckling load for columns is going to be pi squared EI uh, divided by KL squared. KL squared. So pi squared EI over KL squared. And this is interesting. So you've probably seen this formula before in mechanics uh, or, earlier, or earlier coursework. Um, but this is kind of interesting. So notice what appears here and what doesn't. Uh, notice that we're using the modulus of elasticity, and, but we're not using the uh, elastic stress or the, uh, the elastic yield, uh, sorry, the yield stress like sigma y, um, or we're not using the, co the compressive uh, or the compression, uh, the, sorry, the crushing stress like we would have in concrete, an F prime C. Instead, this is, this is determined by E, the modulus elasticity. So we can see through that, that this is actually a deformation phenomena rather than a uh, simple strength phenomenon. So also it depends on I, uh, the modulus less, uh, sorry, the uh, moment of inertia, uh, the rectangular moment of inertia, and then we have this KL. So let's talk about uh, I first in this context and see what we mean by this. So I know I'm uh, I am uh, fairly certain you know what moment of inertia is. So I don't I'm not going to define it, but more uh, but rather I just want to consider 
some of the unique considerations or discuss some of the unique considerations we have to look at uh, with columns and especially col and specifically column buckling. So if you have a shape, for example, a wide plan shape, And hopefully it's better built than my diagram here. <laughs> but say you have a wide plan shape. Um, you know the moment of inertia, you know how to calculate that, or you can look it up in a table. But if you have your x and your y axis about that shape, then we know that ix is in equal to iy. The moment of inertia about the x axis is not going to be the same as the moment of inertia about the y axis. However, um, in buckling, what's going to govern is basically your I minimum. Uh, this is going to want to deform outward in the direction of the minimum uh, moment of inertia. So again, because the moment of inertia uh, in, in the context of buckling basically represents the, uh, the ability of a cross section to resist buckling. And so the, uh, and because the, uh, because this is in the numerator, the smaller the moment of inertia, the uh, smaller the critical load. And so the, the con governing or, con or controlling uh, I is going to be in whatever direction um, that occurs in. Also, keep in mind that it's not necessary. Now, for a W section, I min uh, will align with, the, for a W section, I min will align with uh, the X or the Y axis, specifically uh, the Y, but. Uh, I min will align with a cardinal axis, but um, for more complex shapes, it need not be along Ix or Iy. Uh, and that's very common to see in, for example, angles, uh, angle irons or L-shaped uh, sections, that kind of thing. Okay. So this is global oil co oiler uh, column buckling. There is also something, as, so it's, this can be referred to as a variety of things. You can call this uh, elastic flexural buckling. You can call this oiler column buckling, or you could also call this global buckling. But because it applies to the entire, it's, called, it's referred to as global because it refers to the entire cross-section as a single uh, element. We're investigating the strength of this thing to resist buckling when looking at the entire cross-section. But there's also such a thing as local buckling, although we're not going to work on the calculation of that today. I, I did just want to mention it briefly. There is also another kind of buckling, which is local buckling. And I'm just going to mention it, and we're not, we're not going to work with calculating it, but it is something you should, at this level of your education, that I hope you're, uh, that I'd like you to at least be aware of. And local buckling um, in the context of a, um, of a, of compression is uh, the failure by buckling of a single of a single component or section of a cross section slash piece of a cross section. So for example, say you have a C channel and look at this flange here. Consider this flange here. Um, when I'm applying compressive load, when I'm complying compressive load to a column, let's say I have a, a C channel and I'm using that C channel. This is the cross-sectional area and I'm applying compressive load to it. So this, this is experiencing a compression, a, a compressive force into the page. Well, 
Now the whole, so with the calculation of Euler column buckling, the global flexural buckling, I'm assuming that the entire section is going to fail simultaneously. I'm assuming that we'll reach a, that, uh, that the, um, that the entire section will fail simultaneously, that I'll be able to fully engage its uh, strength. And thus what matters is the overall combined moment of inertia. However, think about this for a moment. Um, this column here, or sorry, this, this piece of the cross section, this flange here, uh, also in theory, would this not have the ability to buckle independently of the rest of this? Think about something like this. Couldn't this do this kind of, like some sort of buckling like that or some sort of buckling like that? Couldn't it crumple and, and bend about itself? And the truth is, yes, it can. You can get buckling about a single component of a cross section rather than the entire cross section. And the ability of the, so think about this. Imagine you isolated that flange and tried to, and applied compressive, a compressive load just directly to that. Well, if you did that, that would have its own, you could analyze that as another Euler buckling case and treat it as its own tiny column. But what prevents it from, what prevents this relatively small plate here from buckling under a rel relatively small load is that it is braced by this corner here. But that bracing uh, ability does not have a infinite capacity. And uh, as you apply higher and higher loads, Sometimes if uh, there are some cases where, well, there is a limit on that force. There's limit on the stress that is capable of, uh, that this corner is capable of bracing the, uh, this flange. And uh, for some shapes, especially light metal shapes, like uh, things like uh, uh, metal stud walls and things used in office buildings, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes this local uh, failure, this lo local buckling failure will occur before the uh, global uh, buckling of the entire cross section. So you can get uh, local buckling in addition to global buckling. And uh, actually, you know, if, if you ever get a chance, I would highly recommend taking a, if you're ever going to grad school or something, I would highly recommend taking a course on stability. Um, again, stability is investigating the effects of global and local buckling, uh, looking at how shapes deform and uh, and fail uh, sometimes at, at stresses and forces well below what you would predict by Euler column buckling, and that but that's an entire subdiscipline of structural engineering. Anyway, I want to get back to uh, design and looking at global behavior. I just wanted to introduce the idea of local buckling. Uh, this is something you consider more in a steel design class and in other uh, coursework. So let's look at global behavior. And how do we handle, specifically, how do we handle uh, compressive strength in design? So, again, I'm going to be ignoring local buckling, but that's fine. We're going to be looking at just global behavior in this class. So, uh, column design strength. Now, uh, or design process. I'm going to be ignoring, uh, in this discussion here, I'm going to be ignoring uh, resistance factors or factors of safety. I'm just going to be talking about the uh, nominal capacity right now. So because buckling is so important in the design of columns, we really have to, uh, have to see that the, uh, uh, the capacity of a column is not just dependent on the cross section, it's dependent on its length. So I'm going to create a plot of KL and uh, maybe P nominal, where P nominal would be the nominal compressive uh, strength. And so, and KL is the effective length. Now I should go and discuss briefly what effective length is. That's important to, because the brace conditions do matter or the support conditions of columns are very important. So I should briefly mention, uh, I should briefly mention the K factor. 
which is your support factor or bracing factor, depending on how you want to look at it. Although the technical term is the effective length factor. K is your effective length factor. And what it really considers is support conditions. So what do I mean by, what do I mean by this? Well, think about this for a moment. Uh, how I brace the ends of a column will have a great effect on its ultimate uh, buckling capacity. So imagine a fixed column. And let's say I could move these supports and apply an axial load like this, or a pinned column. And applying axial load to either of them. The fixed column is going to want to deform, uh, it will have to keep its end slope uh, still perpendicular to the support. So it will have a deformed shape, something like this, while the pinned column, when it's compressed, will have a deformed shape like this. We have a more complex curvature here than here, so this here will have a, uh, a larger or a greater uh, load then um, if I call this one P1 and P2, P1 is going to be greater than P2. The force required to buckle a fixed fixed column is going to be greater, much greater than the force required to buckle a pinned pin column. And we refer to that as the, and, and to handle that, we, uh, we use the effective length factor for a, and I will go ahead, I will post a, uh, a document or a, an image on, or a PDF on the website to indicate, uh, or just to indicate a whole series of these supports. But for a fixed fixed column, the, um, for a fixed fixed column, the K factor, well, there's two basically. For a fixed fixed, it's 0 0.5, at least theoretically. So 0 0.5, 0 0.65, and then the pin pin we have uh, 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. And the reason these have two different values is these are the theoretical values. And these would be your recommended design. If I can manage to write the word design. So in other words, from basic mechanics, if you uh, if you apply basic mechanics and try to count, you know, using deformation equations and such, uh, energy considerations, whatever you might be doing, if you go and calculate the K factor theoretically for a fixed fixed, you'll get 0 0.5, and theoretically, and the theoretical value um, for uh, pin pin will be 0 0.7. Although it's generally recommended that you use 0 0.65 and 0 0.8 when doing design, but uh, Again, and then if you have uh, things like, uh, and there are other factors if you have, uh, you know, pinned fixed, pinned free, uh, free, fixed free, um, for any kind of support conditions, there are certain, uh, there are certain, um, there are certain, uh, there's a certain K factor. Now, let's look at this uh, plot. So again, just be aware of K factor. K factor considers the, uh, K is the effective length factor. And it factor and it considers uh, support conditions uh, in the buckling strength of columns. So in design, we're going to have this kind of behavior here. Something you've probably seen before. Uh, so the overall uh, capacity uh, beyond a certain point, we will have a, uh, a a curve that is dominated by buckling. And this is just going to be your Euler uh, buckling equation, pi squared EI over KL squared. 
And KL can, is referred to as the effective length. And critically, L here is not the overall length of the column, but the unbraced length. So if you have a uh, two, if you have uh, say a brace in the middle here, then your KL would be half of the column height. Also consider that this is based on the, uh, the minimum uh, in either direction. So if you have uh, different support conditions in different directions, then, um, and interacting with the cross section and I and such, uh, radius of gyration, moment of inertia, et cetera, the minimum capacity in either direction will occur. However, there is one problem with just with designing with just the Euler buckling strength and that is, or the Euler buckling load. And that is that, look what happens. Uh, according to this equation, as the length approaches zero, um, well, the limit of this equation would be infinity. And so as length goes to zero, the, the, the strength according to Euler column buckling approaches infinity. And we know from, um, we know that uh, columns of course don't have infinite strength. So there's going, so what we're going to do is, even though, the, even though the equation would keep going like this, we apply an upper value and that is the yield strength or the crushing strength of the column. Yield strength if you're dealing with a, a ductile material like steel, compressive strength if you're dealing with a uh, material like concrete. But uh, here, we might just say PY for yield, and that would be, uh, for example, sigma Y, the yield stress times the gross cross-sectional area. So again, the buckling curve would indicate that the, uh, would say as the length gets shorter, uh, you will go up to infinity. And, but uh, we cut it off at the yield strength because um, at lengths below this critical level, below this critical level, yield strength will control. Or in other words, you can't get more out of, bu you can never get more out of buckling or out of a column than the yield strength or the, or the crushing strength. And then we have a term to distinguish between these two types of columns. We refer to these as uh, short columns or stubby columns or uh, things like that. And we refer to these as slender columns. If your column is going to be, uh, if the strength of your column is going to be governed by um, flexural buckling, we refer to it as a slender column. If it's uh, controlled just by yield strength, then this would be uh, referred to as a, uh, referred to as a, uh, if it's just determined by yield strength or uh, crushing, then we refer to it as a short column. Also, we can also do this, uh, you can do this two ways. You can do this in terms of uh, forces as shown here, or you can do it in terms of stresses. And I wanna show what that looks like when you're doing, uh, I wanna show what it looks like if you uh, curate that same plot, but for stresses. Because you can transform, it is certainly possible, it is entirely possible to transform the equation for Euler buckling load uh, to an Euler buckling stress just by dividing by the area. And let's look at that. So, let's say our buckling load, PCR, uh, here, uh, PCR equals that same pi squared EI over KL squared. Well, if I want to get a stress, sigma critical, I could just divide this by area, cross-sectional area. So pi squared EI divided by uh, A, right? Like shown. And so I'd still have that KL squared here. Now, um, so I know that uh, radius of gyration is equal to the square root of I over A. Radius of gyration is equal to the square root of I over A, basically combining both of these factors. So um, therefore R squared 
would just equal i over a. So putting those together, I could get that a yield stress for, or not a yield stress, a critical stress for buckling, for Euler column buckling, global flexural buckling. Uh, it would be pi squared, if you do the algebra, you'll get pi squared e divided by kl over r, quantity squared. And again, often we refer to as kl as the effective length. So this can be done for uh, stresses or forces. And if you wanted to do, uh, if you wanted to turn this diagram into a stress diagram, that wouldn't be too difficult. So let's uh, get rid of this. The shape will remain unchanged. The general shape will remain unchanged, except we'll just change some of the labeling to turn this into a stress diagram. So here we'll have, uh, instead of force, we'll have stress sigma, a normal stress. And then here you would have your critical stress, your critical buckling stress of pi squared E divided by KL over R, quantity squared. And then, um, and again, what we'll control on this is the, uh, well, actually, if you think about the, uh, the, the way the equation would work, the KL over R factor, in, if you looked at different directions, like the X direction and Y direction of a column, think about which one of these would control. Uh, the lowest stress will control, so therefore the largest KL over, KL over R will control. But anyway, the critical buckling stress is that, or we would just have the yield stress as our limit here. Okay, so again, um, let's review a bit. Uh, your, uh, for columns, tension is, for axial forces, tension is relatively easy. Um, the limit on tensile stress is simply going to be the yield stress of material uh, before we get in, into any kind of safety modifiers like uh, resistance reductions, resistance factors, or factors of safety. Again, I'm just talking nominal capacity right now. With, with compression, things get a lot more complicated. You have to start worrying about um, buckling, either global buckling or local buckling. And this is, this is interesting enough to the point where people will debate whether compressive strength act at all actually exists. And, when you, and ultimately, uh, this is sort of uh, controlled in some way by the outward tensile capacity of a uh, column under compression. Again, when you're compressing something, it needs to bow out that way, uh, bow out radially. And it, that is a, a tensile limit. So, um, so in a way, uh, compression and tension are intimately related. Uh, and then in actual design, uh, in the actual design equations, uh, we can create a plot like this for short and slender columns, and we can do that for either um, for either uh, stress or force. And uh, some other things be aware of that you need to look and be aware when investigating this that you need to consider both the x and the y direction. And finally, um, be aware of the definitions of radius of gyration, and in particular, be aware of the effective length factor. Okay, so that is a very brief, very rapid introduction to columns. Any questions? I know that was a lot. Hopefully that wasn't too bad. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for today. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to leave questions or comments in the... Uh, in the comments below. Uh... All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to leave any questions or comments uh, in the comments below. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. Uh, regardless, I hope you found this enjoyable. Hope you found this a little interesting. And I will see you. I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.